Hello and welcome to College Physics 1, Lecture 22, Apparent Forces, Orbits, and Gravity. In our previous lecture, we introduced the concept of circular motion. Here, we're going to take a look at apparent forces that result from circular motion, and then the specific cases of circular motion that involve orbits and gravity. To begin, let's actually start with a really fascinating conceptual discussion. Suppose that you are in a car that turns a corner quickly. So just imagine perhaps you're the driver and you, let's say you suddenly take your vehicle and you, for whatever reason you suddenly turn to the right pretty sharply. If you do that, you can probably imagine right now that you would feel thrown kind of outward against your door. So it feels like something is like pushing you or kind of pulling you off to the side into the door of your vehicle when you take that sharp turn to the right. But is there really such a force? I mean, this seems contrary to everything we discussed in our previous lecture about circular motion, because we stated that in circular motion, there's always a net force that points toward the center of a circle. But in this discussion and in real life, we feel thrown outward away from the center of the circle in our vehicle when we take a sharp turn. So what's going on here? Well, before the turn, you in the seat of your vehicle were moving in, say, a straight line. And so according to Newton's first law, which states that an object in motion will continue in straight line motion at a constant speed, unless acted upon by another force, well, according to that, your body wants to keep moving in that same straight line. But when you take your sharp turn, the door basically cuts you off. It moves in front of you. Your body keeps trying to move straight ahead, but the door turns and moves in front of you, and so the car basically cuts you off, and so you run into the car door. So it is this force uh, of the car door, for example, pushing inward toward the center of the circle that allows you to turn, in the, uh, to turn the corner with the vehicle. In that case, it would be the normal force of you pressed up against the door. Even if you uh, don't turn sharp enough to be physically pushed up against your car door, it would be the static friction of you against your seat, holding you in place. And so this quote-unquote force that we seem to experience when we take these sharp turns in circular motion is what we call the centrifugal force, which is annoying. Even though it's called a force, it's not a real force. This is just kind of an experience due to Newton's first law. So there's nothing physically pushing or pulling you out toward the door of your vehicle, it's just you wanting to move ahead in a straight line and your car turning in front of you. So let's start looking at some really interesting cases of apparent forces in circular motion. Let's begin um, by just thinking of an example uh, to kind of relate what we just discussed in that previous example to something you can prove right now. Um, so just imagine you take your one of your arms and you spin it pretty rapidly in a vertical circle like you can kind of see in this image. Well, the motion of you spinning your arm in a circle will act like a centrifuge. In other words, you're spinning your arm around really, really quickly, which means the blood in your arm is going to be kind of forced outward, just like your body in a vehicle, toward your hand. And so as a result, there's going to be a buildup of blood in your hand, and you'll be able to feel that pretty quickly by doing this. So just test that out real quick. If you spin your arm around rapidly, you can basically feel the blood being rushed to your hand due to this centrifugal quote unquote force. So that's just a quick way to sort of prove what we've been discussing. So let's move ahead and discuss apparent weight in the context of circular motion. To do this, we're going to consider a roller coaster that's going around a vertical loop of radius r. Now, one thing I will say is Technically, it, you, if you've ever seen a roller coaster loop, they are not perfect circles. They actually have sort of an upside down teardrop shape where you like gradually uh, move into a smaller and smaller circle path or circular path. Uh, that's actually because if you suddenly went into a circular loop, you would be in excruciating pain most likely. And it could even kill you if you're moving fast enough in a small enough circle. But that's beside the point. Our discussion here is going to focus on two points along this circular loop, at the very top and the very bottom. 
If you've ever been on a roller coaster loop, you'll know that the sensation that you experience as you move around of your weight is going to change. So let's first take a look at what happens at the bottom of the circular path. At the bottom, you have two forces acting on you, your weight downward and the normal force of your seat pushing upward. Now notice by the free body diagram, the center of the circle is above you, so we label our x-axis above us. In other words, upward. So you can see that in the bottom right, the x-axis is labeled upward. Additionally, uh, we should recognize that the normal force in this case is larger than the weight, and there's a good reason for this. Keep in mind that in circular motion, there's always a net force. And so if there's always a net force that, in this case, always points toward the center of the circle, the force that's pointing toward the center of the circle has to be larger, which is the normal force in this case. By writing out Newton's laws, we'll see that the sum of forces in that x direction would be the positive normal force minus the weight. And if you recall from our past discussions, the x uh, equation is always set equal to mv squared over r because there's always an acceleration in that direction. So we have n minus w equals mv squared over r at the bottom of this loop. Now also keep in mind from past discussions that we learned about apparent weight, which is equal to the magnitude of supporting contact forces. In the case of this example, the supporting force against you is the normal force. That's what's supporting you in your seat. So our apparent weight, or the weight that we feel or sense, is the normal force. So we've rearranged the equation for normal force to give us mv squared over r plus w. This is a very fascinating equation. Think about what this is showing us. It's saying the weight that you feel, or your apparent weight, is equal to your true weight w plus something else. So this is really interesting. So this is showing you that your apparent weight is greater than your actual true weight because it's your weight plus something else. So this is why you feel heavier at the bottom of a circular track. If you've ever been on a roller coaster in a big dip, you kind of feel forced or pushed down into your seat a little bit harder than normal. And this equation essentially proves that by again saying that the weight that you feel is equal to your true weight plus something else. Okay, well now let's look at the top of the roller coaster track. Up here we have a very interesting case because we're on the inside surface of the track, which means that the surface is above us. As a result, our normal force in this case, and we haven't seen this in an example we've done yet, points downward, perpendicular to the surface, so straight down. So our free body diagram in this case has two forces pointing downward, the normal force and the weight, which is toward the center of the circle, so the x-axis points downward. This gives us an equation for the sum of forces in the x-direction, n plus w. They're both pointing downward in the positive x-direction, so they're both positive values. And again, the x equation in circular motion is always set equal to mv squared over r. Well, in this case, let's set up uh, our discussion just like we did for the bottom of the track by determining what our parent weight would be. Our parent weight is equal to the normal force, which means we end up with mv squared over r minus the weight. So this is a, a pretty interesting case here. So think about what happens. So looking at this equation here, uh, where we have v, as your velocity decreases, so say you, keep, you go slower and slower, say each time you go through the loop, well eventually you're going to move slow enough for this term, mv squared over r, to perfectly equal whatever your weight is. I don't know why I'm using my mouse to circle things, I have a pen. Anyways, um, so at some point, you're going to slow down enough for this term here to be the same value as whatever your weight is. So let's just say, I mean, this is just a random thing. Let's say this is 11 and this is 11. Well, then that means your normal force is equal to 11 minus 11, which equals 0. 
So eventually you can slow down enough that the normal force becomes zero. Which means your apparent weight be is becomes zero because the normal force is your apparent weight. So if your normal force is zero, that means nothing is there to support you anymore. Because by definition, the normal force is what's supporting you. So at that instant, the seat is no longer pushing against you. You experience weightlessness because your apparent weight is equal to zero and you would fall from the seat. So in other words, there's a minimum possible speed you can travel before you would fall out of the seats, which hopefully you're strapped in with a harness, of course, but still. So we call this the critical speed or V subscript C. When the normal force is equal to zero and you would actually fall out of the circle, this is the slowest speed you can travel at to complete the circle. Anything below this and you would fall off the track. Okay. So let's work on an example. We're going to start with a basic example and then get into a much more complicated one. Just to kind of get us started here, let's do a basic example that says a 1500 kilogram car moves over a circular 60 meter radius hill at 20 meters per second. At the peak of the hill, what is the normal force? All right, so just imagine we're going over this circular hill. Let's draw a free body diagram with a dot representing our vehicle. And keep in mind, we have to label our axes appropriately in circular motion. That means that the x-axis points toward the center of the circle. In this case, if we're at the top of a circular hill, the center of the circle is below us, and so we label the x-axis downward. Again, because the x-axis always points toward the center of the circle, which is below us. We have two forces acting on our vehicle. Uh, we're assuming there's no friction. And so we have a normal force of the surface pushing up against the vehicle. But we also have a weight point, pointing downward. That said, the weight must be larger than the normal force because... By definition in circular motion, you must always have a net force pointing toward the center of the circle. That means whatever force is pointing toward the center of the circle must be the larger force to produce that overall net force pointing down. At this point, we can set up our uh, Newton's second law in component form, which says that the sum of forces in the x direction and the sum of forces in the y direction are equal to something. Well, in the x direction, we have the weight in the positive x direction. I know this is counter to what we're so used to. Usually down means negative, but we've set it up so that the positive x-axis points downward. So be careful. Positive weight, that means n is pointing in the opposite direction or the negative direction. And again, we're always equal to mv squared over r in circular motion. In the y direction, in other words, the other direction, there's just, there's nothing there. So it's just equal to zero. So this problem wants us to solve for the normal force, in other words, n. Well, n only shows up in one place in our x equation. So let's use that to solve. Uh, so I'm just going to write the equation again. So we have uh, weight minus normal force equal to mv squared over r. Well, this means that the normal force, if I add normal force to the other side, then subtract the mv term over, we would see that the normal force is equal to the weight minus mv squared over r. Okay, so just a little algebra, swapping n and mv squared over r. Now, at this point, we technically don't know the weight of the vehicle. We know it's a mass of 1,500 kilograms which means we simply have to write this as mg, right? Weight, by definition, is mass times the acceleration due to gravity. So at this point, we are able to solve. We just need to plug in our values and see what we get. Here we have the mass of 1,500 kilograms, the acceleration due to gravity, which is our standard 9.8 meters per second squared, minus the mv squared over r term, where the mass, again, is 1,500 kilograms, 
The speed, V, is 20 meters per second, given in the problem. And, oh, don't forget to square that. And all of this is divided by the radius of the circular path, which was also kindly given to us as 60 meters. So if we plug all of this in, and hopefully correctly, we should see a normal force using scientific notation of 5 times 10 to the third newtons. In other words, 5,000 newtons. And there you have it. So all things considered, not too bad of an example. It's fairly short uh, and um, simple. I just like to throw this one in here just to kind of recap our concepts that are a little confusing in circular motion. Like uh, pointing the x direction in the right way, showing that the weight's the larger force, and things like that. Well, now that we've done a basic example, let's do a much more complicated one. Oop, I wasn't supposed to show the free body diagram right away, but anyways. Uh, in this example, it says a Stone Age hunter stands on a cliff overlooking a flat plain. He places a one kilogram stone in a sling, ties the sling to a one meter long vine, and then swings the rock in a horizontal circle around his head. The plane of motion is 25 meters above the plane. Note we're using two planes, P-L-A-N-E is the plane of the circular path of the rock. P-L-A-I-N is the ground way below him. So he's on a cliff edge with the ground way below him. Suddenly, uh, you know, as he picks up speed, swinging this thing around more and more and more, once the tension reaches 200 newtons, the vine snaps, and the rock goes flying off the edge of the cliff. This question asks, how far from the cliff does it land? So this is actually quite a long problem, but... For the purposes of this discussion, in this video, I'm only going to go th halfway through it. We're going to solve, if we follow our um, problem solving strategy, it tells us essentially that we have to find the speed V first. That's as far as I'm going to go in this problem. Once you find the speed, you can figure out how far it travels, but it just becomes a projectile motion problem at that point, which is from our old material and it's not relevant to our circular motion discussion right now. So I'm going to leave the last half of the problem for you to solve on your own time if you are so inclined to kind of test your understanding of that material a little bit more. So um, as I mentioned, I didn't mean to show the free body diagram right away, but let's just discuss the visuals here. You can see that the man is swinging the rock around at some angle from the horizontal, not in a perfectly horizontal plane. It's, I mean, the rock itself is swinging around in a horizontal plane, but it's angled down from where... Uh, his hand is. And the length L describes how long the rope is, or the vine in this case. Now, one thing we just need to be careful of, and I'm going to come back to this in just a moment, is the radius of the circular path is not the same thing as the length L. This line here is R. So something interesting will happen as a result of that. It means we just have to do a little extra work. And notice, because of alternate interior angles, this angle down here is also theta. This becomes relevant soon. So if we were to draw a free body diagram for this motion with the rock over here, the center of the circle is to the right of the rock, so we draw our x-axis to the right of the rock. That's toward the center of the circle. Now there are only two forces acting on the rock, which thankfully that's all. We have the weight of the rock acting downward, and the tension in the vine pulling up and to the right. This is the setup for our problem. Now that we have our free body diagram drawn, let me just add in one little thing here to that free body diagram. Because we're going to be summing our forces in the x and y direction, and it's been a while since we've done this, keep in mind we have a, a vector at an angle, which means we have to deal with its components. The x component, or this horizontal component, is the adjacent side of the triangle. So comparing that to the hypotenuse t, we would see that the x component is t cosine theta. Because cosine is adjacent hypotenuse. And then this vertical piece, the y direction here, that's the opposite side of the angle. And so we would see 
uh, ty is t sine theta. So with this in mind, let's write down Newton's second law in component form. So even though this is a complicated problem, it starts the same way as any other problem. You draw a free body diagram and write out Newton's laws. Now in the x direction, horizontally, all we have is the x component of the tension. So that is t cosine theta. And by definition, as we keep saying, the x direction is always set equal to mv squared over r. In the y direction, vertically, we have two forces. We have the y component of the tension pulling upward, so t sine theta, and then the weight pulling downward. Uh, oh, uh, that's minus the weight. And by definition in circular motion, the y equation is always equal to zero. There is no acceleration vertically in this case. Okay, so that is the setup to the problem. Now, if you recall our problem solving strategy for these types of problems, circular dynamics problems, if you are looking for a kinematic value, so that could be period or frequency or distance or time or speed, well, maybe not speed, but any of those kinematic values, the problem solving strategy tells you that you first need to solve for the speed v from your force equations. Now, I'm not saying that you have to just memorize the rules of the problem solving strategy. It's just a hint or a guide for you. You'll, if you can really work about this, you know, work through this problem, you would realize at some point that you would have to find the speed anyways. But the problem solving strategy just gives us like a head start on figuring out what to do. So let's follow that problem solving strategy to solve for V. Now looking at this equation, V only shows up right here. In order to solve for the speed V, that means we need to know everything else in the equation. We do know the mass of the stone. We technically don't know the radius of its path yet. We know the length of the vine. We know the tension in the rope, but we don't know the angle. So we don't know the angle and we technically don't know the radius r, but we know we have to solve this equation for v. So this is an indication that we have to solve for theta and r first before we can actually solve for the speed. So this is where it gets complicated. Students, I mean, usually given this problem, students would struggle in figuring out what to do next and understandably so. We have to find theta and r first. To find theta, right, to find the theta that we need to solve, let's solve for it from right down here. In the y equation, we have a theta that we can solve for. So let's do that. I'm going to rewrite this y equation on the next slide, which is t sine theta. minus the weight is equal to zero. We're looking to solve for theta. So what I'm gonna do is add the extra term weight to the other side, and I'm gonna write that as mg, because weight is mg, and then divide by the tension. So this is gonna give us sine theta is equal to mg the weight divided by the tension t. With this, we're close to solving for the angle theta, but it's still inside of the sine function. So to get a angle outside of a trig function, you take the inverse of that trig function. In other words, we say theta is equal to the sine minus one or inverse sine of the stuff on the other side of the equation, mg over t. So this will give us uh, the sine minus one of the mass m, which is one kilogram, times g, the acceleration due to gravity, 9.8 meters per second squared. Then all of that divided by the tension, which is told to be 200 newtons once the uh, vine snaps. This gives us an angle, a shallow angle at that, of just 2.81 degrees. 
Now, we've figured out the angle theta, so let me go back for a second. That means we can now use this equation to solve, except we still technically don't know the radius r. So let's come over to this diagram here on the left hand side. We need to know what the radius r is, this red line. We know now the angle theta and we know what the length L of this vine is. That's the hypotenuse. We know the angle. We're looking for the adjacent side, R. So the trig function that uses adjacent and hypotenuse is cosine. So let us use the cosine trig function to solve for our radius of circular path, R. By definition, cosine of theta is equal to adjacent over hypotenuse. In this case, the adjacent side is your radius r, the hypotenuse is the length of the vine l. So this is going to show, if you're solving for r, that r, that's a pretty rough r, uh, but r is equal to l cosine theta. Right? Just multiply l to the other side here. Well, this gives us a length of one meter times cosine of 2.81. And that's uh, degrees. Now, this is such a small angle that multiplying by a trig function of such a small angle barely affects the number at all. So you actually end up with basically 0 0.999 meters. Still, it matters to do this, to be accurate. So at this point, we now have the missing values that we needed. So now let's take our values and go back to the x equation and solve finally for the speed v. So at this point, I'm going to rewrite our x equation from the previous slide. That was t cosine theta equals mv squared over r. T cosine theta equals mv squared over r. We want to solve for the speed v, so multiply r to the other side, divide by mass, and take the square root. So we're going to have the square root of r t cosine theta divided by the mass. And again, my r almost looks like an n. Forgive that, that's an r. So at this point, we do know everything finally in the equation. Let's plug in and solve. R was one meter. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, excuse me, that was 0.999 meters. Uh, go back to the pen, okay. Uh, so 0 0.999 meters. The tension was 200 newtons. And then we have cosine of that small angle, 2.81 degrees. So this is all underneath the square root. Oops. If it lets me write it. There we go. And this is all divided by the mass m, which was 1 kilogram. So if we plug this in, we'll get about 14.1 meters per second. Again, this is where we're going to stop, so I'm going to box this as our answer, but you can now use this speed in a projectile motion-esque problem to uh, solve for how far away from the hill or the cliffside that the uh, rock lands. If you have the textbook that we use, if you're in my course, this I believe is example 6.16 in the textbook, if you wanted to just see the rest of the problem. Um, but for clarity, I'm not going to give you a projectile motion problem if you're in my class on our current exam that's coming up because we're using circular motion, not projectile motion. I want to stay focused on the circular motion aspect of a problem. Okay, well this brings us into our final topics of this lecture. The first of them is orbits. So. This is a really cool discussion because a lot of people don't really understand what an orbit is. Technically, something in orbit 
is always falling down to the earth without ever getting closer to the earth. Which sounds absurd. So let's use a conceptual example to set this up. Consider a very tall tower of height h. We're talking like all the way up through the atmosphere and, and possibly uh, physical tower. And let's say you're standing at the top of that tower and you launch a projectile horizontally off the tower. If you do so at a very low speed, it's just going to fall down and hit the ground close to the tower, of course. Well, let's say you throw it a little harder. Well, it's going to move further away from the tower before it hits the ground. Now let's say you launch it really hard. Well, if you're launching it so hard from this tower that's impossibly high up, the ground, because the earth is round, sorry flat earthers, the earth is round, uh, because the earth is round, if you launch the ball, the ground starts curving away from the ball. In other words, the object that you're launching has to catch up to the ground as it curves away from it. So here's a visual of what we're talking about. An impossibly tall tower, compared to the, the size of our planet. If you launch a ball just a little bit, it falls down close to the tower. But as you throw it harder and harder and harder, notice the ground curving away from you. So it's going to have to kind of fall around part of the planet before it hits the ground. Same thing again, you can launch it even harder. Well, it's going to have to catch up to the curvature of the Earth and might not land until it reaches kind of the other side of the planet. Well, that just keep going with this. Eventually, if you launch it hard enough, you're going to launch it so that it's uh, moving in a path that's parallel to the ground. In other words, um, the trajectory of your object and the ground of the Earth are both curving at the exact same rate. That means you're going to come back to your starting point and you've completed a circular path around a planet. This is what we call an orbit. An object r moving around the Earth or other planet but it's technically falling without ever getting closer to the ground. So hopefully this little visualization helps you make sense of that statement I just said, because again, it still sounds weird. It's falling without getting closer. And now you can hopefully see why. Because the Earth is curving away from the object as it falls. Well, this brings in a really interesting discussion uh, from Newton once again. We've discussed Newton's three laws of motion, but Newton is also famous for a law of gravity. He understood that gravity is a universal force, meaning it affects literally everything in the universe. So he proposed that this force acts on every single other object in the universe. In other words, every object attracts every single other object in the universe, and vice versa. That doesn't mean everything is going to come plumbing it into one spot. Because this effect weakens significantly with distance to the point that it becomes negligible at certain distances. And we can represent this mathematically by Newton's law of gravitation. We say if two objects with masses m1 and m2 are a distance r apart, they will exert attractive forces on one another given by the magnitude below. g, capital G, m1 times m2, divided by the distance between them r squared. So that r squared is, again, me basically saying that distance matters a lot. If you have a huge distance between the two objects, well, you're squaring that distance and dividing by it, so you're going to be dividing by a huge number, and so the effect of the force that you experience basically will go to zero when you reach crazy high distances like those throughout the universe. Now, that big value g is a new number, it's a constant, it's always the same number, in other words. And so that is the gravitational constant, g, given by 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 newton meters squared per kilogram squared. Unfortunately, the units are hideous, that's just the way it is. So to conclude our lecture, let's just do a very simple example using this equation, so you can see how it's applied, and in perhaps a somewhat realistic uh, example. I just told you, or well, Newton said it, I'm just repeating what he says, but Newton's law of gravity states that everything is attracting everything else, which means you, having a mass, are technically attracting everything around you. So let's take a look at that kind of a situation. Let's say you're sitting in class uh, half a meter away from another student. 
And let's assume you both have a mass of 65 kilograms. The question asks, what is the magnitude of the gravitational force between you? In other words, how much force are you exerting on the person next to you just by sitting next to them? Well, that force, as we saw, is given by uh, the law of gravity, gmm over r squared. This is going to seem like a, a ridiculously simple problem after what we just did. But in this case, all we do is plug in our numbers. We don't have any rearranging. We don't have Newton's laws or free body diagrams. Just plug in your values. G, uh, was, as we said, was 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 Newton meters squared per kilogram squared. Your mass is 65 kilograms. The other student's mass is also 65. Uh, I just wrote 625. They would be quite heavy if that was the case. Uh, 65 kilograms for both. And we divide all of this by the distance between you squared. So uh, 0 0.50 meters squared. This will give you a force of attraction between your two bodies of 7.8 times 10 to the negative 7 newtons. This is an incredibly small force. Um, and as a result, you don't actually feel the force. You, just by sitting next to somebody, you don't feel like you're being pulled toward them and vice versa. And so, I mean, it's pretty clear that you need significant masses and smaller distances to make this happen. In this case, the distance isn't very far, but uh, you have a very small mass between your bodies. This is more so an equation to help describe gravitational influences of planets and stars and things like that. So, it is true you are exerting a force. We do have a value here. It's just so small that you don't physically feel it. Okay. Well, I believe that is it for this lecture. We have concluded our discussion of Newton's laws and forces. So this is the end of our second unit of material. From here, we move on to unit three, which we will introduce in our next lecture. As always, thanks for watching and have a great day.